We have supply chain issues. For the first time in 100 years, we're having difficulty putting food on the shelves of our local supermarkets. We have every port in America is packed with 20, 30, 40 cargo ships that are sitting dormant because they can't be unloaded because we don't have dock workers. Our airlines have set a new standard of inefficiency. I read just yesterday that between June 1 and June 28, between our top, top two airlines, Delta and American, we had over 7,000 cancellations. The reason? Because they said they don't have pilots, they don't have stewards, they don't have attendants. Why do we have, why do we have a shortage of people? Because we fired them because they wouldn't take the vaccine. We have thrown hundreds of U.S. Navy SEALs out of the military. We have thrown hundreds of U.S. Army Rangers, Special Forces soldiers, and other soldiers out of the service. The most fit, the most disciplined, the most healthy people on the planet, and we've thrown them out of the military and told them they couldn't serve because they didn't take the vaccine. It's the height of incompetence. And so I have been thinking about that recommendation to maybe open with a joke or provide a little levity, maybe provide a little more chemistry between me and me and the audience. But I'm going to tell you, I'm not interested in providing levity for your entertainment tonight. One of our biggest flaws as citizens of the United States is we lack the appropriate level of sobriety when it comes to the fact we have people that are systematically, methodically disassembling, destroying the United States of America because they hate the United States. And I'm not going to joke about it. We shouldn't grin and laugh and smirk and make small of it. The fact that you are here today tells me a lot. It tells me that you understand the magnitude and the gravity, the significance of the issues that are facing our country. I also infer by you being here, you understand the need for an immediate and comprehensive solution to these problems. The 2022 election is a pivotal, seminal point in the history of our nation. We need to understand that because everybody outside of Georgia does. That's why Raphael Warnock has $25 million coming in from outside the United States, outside of Georgia into his campaign. This election, the way we vote in November, is the way our nation will go. Like you, I've been looking at the candidates. Who's got the vision? Who's got the willpower? Who's got the backbone? to best protect my family. And the very clear answer to that is precisely why I'm here with you tonight. Because I made my choice as Herschel Walker. Now, I'm going to do a couple of things here that are going to throw the campaign staff into cheetah flip. Maybe when I keep stick, stick to the script. But I'm going to introduce Herschel in a way that he's not been introduced before. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about Herschel, and I'm not going to talk to you about Herschel, the athlete. I'm going to talk to you about Herschel, the man. I am sure, I'm confident, Herschel, you're crazy. I don't think there's anybody here. I'm 99.99% sure there's nobody here that has known Herschel longer than I have. I've seen Herschel at great times. I've seen Herschel at bad times. And so, before he comes and addresses you tonight, I want you to give me just a couple of minutes. And I want to tell you some things about Herschel, the man, that you can't learn by reading his biography. The first thing that always comes to my mind, the first adjective, the first descriptor that comes to my mind when I think of Herschel is authentic. He's real. What you see is what you get. Herschel doesn't have a public persona and a private persona like so many politicians. He's exactly what you see. It doesn't matter if he's here in Georgia, if 
be sitting in the Oval Office with the President. It doesn't matter where he is or who he's with. He's the same guy. And if he's talking to you, he's going to give you the same courtesy that he does to the President. That's who he is. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've had people ask me, they pull me aside and say, Mike, give us a deal on Herschel. He can't really be that nice. That's got to be some kind of facade. I tell him, well, the truth is, he's actually nicer than he comes off on TV. Tonight, some of you are going to meet Herschel for the very first time. Eddie, you're going to meet him for the first time. And I want you to know that when he's shaking your hand and he's looking directly into your eye and he's listening to you intently, I want you to understand when he treats you like his next to kin, that that's exactly how he feels. There's not two rehearsals. He is focused on you and he cares about your comments and your opinion. So the first thing I think of when I think about Herschel is authenticity. The second attribute you're not going to find in his bio is about his physical and emotional resilience, his toughness. Herschel is tougher than a $2 steak. <laughs> <laughs> falling apart on television. And, uh, somebody help me out. Who's the congressman from Indiana, from Illinois? He's always crying. Or the January 6th committee. What's his name? Adam Kinsey. Adam Kinsey. Make sure to get that guy doing props. Adam Kinsey. Listen, you don't have to worry about Herschel crying and snotting all over the microphone on TV because somebody hurt his feelings. <laughs> Herschel doesn't fold under pressure. Herschel thrives under pressure his whole life been lived in a pressure cooker. I'm going to tell you something that you veterans know. You don't become tough overnight. You become tough by living a life of hard work and gritting your teeth. And I've had the opportunity to meet some of the toughest people on the planet. And I'm here tonight to tell you the toughest, grittiest guy I know is sitting right here, Herschel Walker. The third thing you won't find in his work ethic is in his bio is his work ethic. His work ethic is impeccable. Herschel and I share a common philosophy. You're going to face people in life that have more talent than you. Maybe they're smarter than you. They have more resources than you. There's any number of things that you can't control. The one thing you can't control is how hard you work. And nobody, under any circumstances, ought to ever be able to outwork you. I'm going to tell you, and I'm probably sharing too much, but it irritates me to no end when our elected representatives are in Washington, D.C. I'm back here working my butt off, and they're screwing around, wasting time on something that absolutely is irrelevant to my life and the life of my family. I think our elected representatives all wake up every morning and open their eyes, and the first thing that crosses their mind is how can I improve the lives of my constituents? How can I improve Georgia today? How can I protect and safeguard the United States of America? Herschel's work ethic will drive him to focus on Georgia goals, and he'll do that without being distracted. And the last thing that I want to tell you that you won't find in his bio, Herschel is kind and he's compassionate. I think we've got press here. Don't misquote me and say, I didn't say he was soft. I said he was kind and compassionate. I have never, in all the time I've known Herschel, ever heard him speak disparagingly to or about anyone. No condescension. Never putting anybody down, always treats everybody with dignity and respect. Herschel has volunteered over his adult life innumerable, innumerable times, I think we've got a map here to show, to visit military installations both here in the United States and around the world, to visit young warriors.
And I always know when Herschel's at a new installation because I'm inundated with emails, phone calls, text messages by young warriors who are elated that Herschel Walker will take the time to come and sit down and talk to him. He does that because he has time and he cares. Back when we had our 25th National Championship in Newton in Athens, I was deployed to Iraq for a year. And if you've been to our reunions, you know that the way we do that is we line everybody up in the center of the field from one end zone to the other, alphabetically A to W, or A to Z, with W being at the end. And Herschel knew that I was gone. My two children, my son and my daughter, were representing me on the field. And they were already calling out the names. Everybody's applauding. Herschel broke ranks, walked down, introduced himself to my two children, pulled out two business cards, wrote his personal cell phone number on the back, handed it to him at the same time, and said, listen, if you have a problem, if you have a need, if there's something you need me to help you with, you call me. You can call me at any time, but particularly while your dad is in Iraq. Both my kids joined the Army, both my kids deployed to Iraq, and now 17 years after that event, both of them still talk about Mr. Walker's kindness passion. There are a number of reasons you may want to vote for Herschel Walker. Some of you are going to vote for him because he's never been a politician. That's a great reason. I am sick and tired of career politicians who spend their lives in D.C. and do nothing. But that's not the reason I'm going to vote for Herschel. There are other people that are going to vote for him because he's a small business owner. That's a good reason, too. I think if we learned anything from President Trump, it's highly advantageous to have somebody that understands the economy, business, a business plan, can read, uh, knows what p and is, can read the balance sheet. That's pretty good stuff to, to do. I think that's a good reason to vote for Herschel. But that's not why I'm voting for Herschel. I'm voting for Herschel Walker because I trust him. I've known Herschel most of my adult life. Herschel is a Christian. Herschel is a Christian. Herschel is a father. He's a small business owner. Herschel has our values. Herschel has our work ethic. And Herschel loves his nation the way that we love our nation. If there's one word that I can sum up this election, 2022, I can tell you this election is completely about trust. The future of our children and grandchildren hang in the balance. And so the question I'll leave you with tonight is, who are you going to trust? I'd ask you to give a very warm and energetic welcome to my good friend and the next senator from Georgia, Herschel Walker.
and Joe Biden cares more about pronouns. And I can tell you right now, Renee doesn't care about pronouns. Joe Biden seems to care more about color. I'm tell you, Bully don't care what color your skin is. And the guy I'm running against, he voted for Joe Biden 96% of the time. And uh, you and I know right now, the recruitment is down in the military. The morale is down in the military. And you and I know Russia, China, Iran, they're not concerned about a war military. They're trained for war. And we're concerned about how do we identify. They're not concerned about that. My opponent right here, one that says he cares about the military. And he cares about the military. Why hasn't he held Joe Biden accountable for that botch in Afghanistan? The 13 service members was killed. He cares about the military. Why has he voted against a $6 billion bill for health care for our military? We don't know that. Cares about the military. How can he say he cannot serve God and the military at the same time? No, that's not correct. And what we're worried about right now is how we identify. And I can tell you right now, Joe Biden woke agenda is going to get many of our men and women killed in our military. So you want to ask me, do I care? how much I care. I care because of people like this that have sacrificed so much for the greatest country in the world. They've given us the liberty and the freedom. And Joe Biden seems to care about wokeness. And I can promise you, Iran, China, I'm not worried about the tape recharging in the desert. <laughs> I can promise you, this is the greatest country in the world because we did the Pledge of Allegiance early. And do you know when we did the Pledge of Allegiance with that flag that National Anthem stands for, but we let the people to office that has forgotten about what that flag means. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this flag in the National Anthem. Because I don't know if you remember Francis Scott Key, years ago, went to the British ships to swap prisoners when they had all the colonies. He went over to swap prisoners when they had the colonies. And as he got over to the British ships, the British captain decided to change the negotiation. And he said, uh, I'm not going to swap prisoners right now. Because what I want you to do is a lower this flag. If y'all lower the flag, we should drop prisoners. And Mr. Key said, well, sir, that really wasn't the deal. He said, I don't care about the deal. We got a lot of weapons out here, and we can take that flag down. And he said, you got to do what you got to do. And when you hear it our national anthem sometimes, you can hear what they say, the red flag in the air. What they're talking about is the bomb from the British ship flying over to hit our American flag. And as it says in the National Anthem, when the air cleared and the daylight came, that flag was still there. And do you know the reason that flag stayed there? Because every time that flag got ready to hit the ground, that their patriots laid against it to keep it up because they believed in America. So right now, we got to elect people to this office now that believes in America and believes in the Constitution of the United States of America. Otherwise, we shouldn't have let them into office. So right now, we have the wrong people at the table negotiating this deal for us. So the right man is first of all. Because I'm going to tell you this story. And I heard this from uh, a friend of mine. He said, everyone think the grass is greener on the other side. But I'm telling you, it's not. Because I'm going to tell you this story. That was this bull out of this field one day. He had grass up, up to his knees. And he had like six cows out there with him. And he, he had everything he wanted. But in the other field that didn't belong to him, there were three other cows in the far distance. 
And he kept his nose at the fence just looking at the three other cows. Not worried about the six that he had right here. And so he decided that he's got to jump the fence. So he was measuring the fence up. He was measuring the fence up, and all of a sudden one day he decided he's going to give it a shot. He backed up. And as he took off running, he dove and barely made it over the top. His belly was all scratched up. But as he got up, he realized, I'm here, I'm here. So he got all excited. He ran up to the top of the hill to meet the other cows, and he realized they were bulls, too. <laughs> and the reason I tell you this is we have forgotten about the liberties and freedoms our great military has given us. And it is time for us to wake up. It is time for us to stand up. And don't be afraid. I'm sick and tired of people being afraid because too many people have died for you to have that freedom and liberty that you have. Too many people have died for you to have the speech that they have guaranteed you to have. So don't be afraid. And I told you, no weapon formed against me. So hey, I love America. And all of you are my family. And I would die and I will fight for you right now. Because I won't wake up tomorrow and realize this country is not the country that I was born in. And if we elect the wrong people to offer this coming November, we are not going to recognize it. I want to thank you and call Mike up and get Mike if you want to ask questions. And this is his microphone, but I want to say God bless you guys. And I want to tell you, come November, tell your friends to get out and vote. Tell your friends to do what they can. Because this is going to be one of the most important elections in our history. It's coming up in November. I can promise you that. You can see what's going on around you right now. I don't have to tell you. You know, I don't have to tell you the gas prices. It's not my fault. But I can't lay it in the hands of the guy I'm running against. You go against the pipeline. You can see the cost of groceries. It's not my fault. We got to run against it. Hold it. Yes. Yeah, the pipe for that pipe. The pipe the, 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 the crime on the street. It's not my fault. We got to run against it. We hold it for solving crime. That's not America. So it's time to put someone at the table that I'm going to say the buck stops here. Hey, I don't have to dance and sing to nobody. I'm not beholden to no one in Washington. I'm not going to to no one and watch that set of voters that put me in office. And I can promise you, I'll fight for it. But I got nothing else to do. And God bless you guys. Thank you guys. Y'all 
Oh, they can hear me. Just with them all veterans, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, okay, good. That was good, so nice. Okay, I spent a little time ahead uh, when you were coming in, probably spoke to I don't know, 30 or 40 of you, asked you some questions uh, dealing with veterans affairs, veterans, national defense, something you would like to ask personally. So I made a list of those, and I'll probably, I don't know how much time we have. What was it? We got time to do it. 30 of them? Okay, so we'll do a handful. I just randomly went through and uh, I selected some of those. The first one is from a guy named Mike Steele. I had them. It's true. First of all, when you and I were in Georgia, we talked a couple of times. I remember you telling me that uh, you had always thought you would end up in the room with you had an affinity for that kind of life. So this is a two-fold question. Why do you want to serve our country? And number two, what changed your mind? Well, I'm going to ask the question, the second part first, and then go to that. But I didn't really change my mind. I grew up in the church, and I had decided I was going to the military. I was going to the Marines, but I couldn't tell my mom and dad you know, mom and dad, I'm going to go to the military because in my little hometown, no one grows up, you know, going to college. You know, that's not, a, that's too big of a dream to go to college. So I always saw people come back from the military, so those are people I only saw. So I wanted to be a Marine. So I was going to wait my family out. I was going to wait them out because, uh, you know, signing day was, I think, in February. So February came and went, I ain't say nothing. March came and went, I ain't say anything. The Easter Sunday, my mom came and said, Bo, for my name. Probably y'all think Bo Jackson, but Bo Jackson, Jackson had never beat Percy Walker in any <laughs> land. <laughs> my mom came to me and she said, Bo, don't you think it's time for you to decide where you want to go to school at? And before I could say anything, she said, but let me tell you this. If your mind and your heart is pure to the Lord Jesus, no matter what decision you make, God will make it right for you. And I said, okay, then I'll put the coin. This is an understood. I feel the call between Jordan and Clemson because everybody hates Clemson and Georgia. So yeah. in the first year, Jordan wins. And I said the best out of five. <laughs> Jordan won an extra time. I was great mom and dad. I love USC out in California. I love USC because I feel that like USC win this coin toss. They let me go to the military. First year, Jordan wins. Next year, USC. Next year, time, Georgia. I said, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to pour the name out of my bag. I poured Georgia all three times. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm going to Georgia, I'm going to Georgia, and that's how I ended up at Georgia. But the reason I wanted to go, because I do know, you know, I hear this all the time, and you guys hear this from one of the greatest presidents that ever, ever served, was a guy by the name of Ronald Reagan. And he said, there's peace through strength. That is totally the truth. There's peace through strength. But what's happening right now, because of Joe Biden with his woke agenda, we get rid of our strength, which is our military. So if we have no strength, I can promise you we're going to have no peace. Do you really feel that China, Iran, and Russia is afraid of us because of the Dallas Cowboys? <laughs> you think they're afraid of us because of the LA Lakers? They don't do what they want to do to us because we got the best military in the world. That if we don't get rid of this wokeness out of our military, Is China is not worried about how you identify. They're not worried about what pronoun you go by. They're not worried about gassing up and charging a tank out in the desert. If you charge a tank, how long do you think that's going to take? Guys, we have to remember our strength is our United States military for international defense. But we also have to support our men and women in blue for our domestic defense. We gotta remember that. Thanks, Russell. This next next question came from Steve. I'll paraphrase it just a little bit. You've long supported our military. Tell us about, tell us about what led you to get so involved with the military and tell us about some of the hundreds of bases and young men and women that you visited around. Well, I, I went through a tough time in my life. 
Uh, you know, I never drank before my life, never tasted beer, never had a drug. But I was bullied as a little kid because my mom said I was big bones. Which meant you were fat. And I used to have a stuttering problem. I couldn't put a sentence together. People used to bully me all the time. I used to get beat up and all this and stuff. And, and at a point in my life, I said, enough of this. And I started working out and started getting bigger, started reading, and I overcame so much. Then I ended up going to the, uh, going to get a scholarship, go to college and all this. But what was funny is I used my athletic career as my coping mechanism. What I mean by that is I didn't want to deal with the pain of being bullied, so I used my athletic career to overcome. That's what made people like me, because I overcame. So but when I didn't have my athletic career, now my anger is going to go somewhere else. And I'm like, what? what's going on with me? Like, what is wrong? Because I'm a Christian. You know, I love God. I love all this. I thought everything is right. And I said, wait a minute, it's personal. You got a mental problem. And I'm like, what? Wait a minute, I can't have a mental problem. I'm cool. I don't want to hide in the truck. I got good grades. You know, this is going to something wrong. So I went and found out that was well, something wrong. I'm like, whoa. So I went and got it taken care of. But then when I got out, I wrote this book and stuff and all this. And somebody said, oh, you know, I work with the military. I'm like, oh, no, I'm not here. I'm like, wait I started talking to some young people from my hometown that was injured mentally, not physically. But yet people were mistreating them. They were calling them names and I was no one on the These guys have sacrificed so much for you. And we're, we're calling them names. We got them out on the street where they can't live. We want to even support them. You know, we got the government not even taking care of people that have almost gave their life up and now they're out on the streets. I said, no, so I decided to go to these bases. You know, they got pins up. I think y'all got y'all don't have enough pins up. I, for 15 years, every three weeks, I would go to a base somewhere in the world. And I would talk to all the young men and women that there's no shame to ask for help. Because I did. And I overcame. So you can overcome too. But you can't be ashamed to admit that it's okay not to be okay. And remember that it's not just about you, it's about your family. It's about your friend. It's about so many other that you're taking care of. Because they sacrifice for you. And they can sacrifice for themselves as well. So that's the reason I started doing that. And that is why one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life. That's one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life. And I said, when I get to office, I'm going to be a champion for the mental health. I'm going to fight for it. And I said, I, I will fight for it because I know we all. And I'm going to tell y'all something y'all may not like. Don't get mad at Herschel Walker. And it's probably going to be a good sound fight tomorrow. But everybody are mentally crazy. <laughs> but some people handle it better than others. <laughs> so I'm saying it's okay if you got a problem because there are people out there that can help you. But you can't be willing to step up to the plate. And I, I told people, and you might say, yeah, I got a problem. Yeah, I'm weak. But don't test me now. I can still throw down if I need to. But don't think. Yeah, that went too far. Anyway, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got a picture of that. <laughs> Having a 29-year experience in combat units in the infantry, I saw a significant amount of mental issues, challenges when they came back. What, when you when you were speaking to these young men, these women, tell me what kind of response did you get? When you said, because there, there's a great reluctance. You're right. They don't want to talk about it. Because we we appropriately fan the flames of I'm tough, I'm strong, uh, I can beat you, and uh, there's some reluctance to admit that. Tell me what kind of you got from these young men. Well, first of all, I put our service men and women with service men and women. I don't try to put with civilians that they got to now because civilians not gonna understand. They haven't seen it, and I I'll give you a prime example. I was at an MMA fight. I was at an MMA fight and I was sitting there and I'm not even gonna name the athlete, but I was sitting at this athlete and one guy got cut real bad. He got cut so bad that he started bleeding everywhere. And all of a sudden you can smell the blood. I don't know if you, you guys seen a cut, but you never smell blood. And the guy went, whoa, what is that? And I said, that's got blood. And I said, he said, whoa, I can't believe it. Well, we send our young men and women over to places that we have no idea what they have to go through. We have no idea what they have to smell, no idea what they have to do. And they do it and they do it well. And then they come back here and we call them names because we watch so many TV shows. 
So by me going over and telling them, guys, I've been through it. Guys have called me names. Guys have done all this stuff to me. But do you know what, somebody? I'm free. Hey, I feel the goodness. Guys, I'm saying, you know, I got out of that, that hospital. I'm in the fall. I'm going to a lot of my fights. I'm doing good. And it gives them the inspiration that they can do it as well. But I tell them it's not going to be easy. But they are out there serving in the women. They've been through it. So that wouldn't work. And that's why I say it ain't gonna be easy. Nothing is easy in life that you want. And if it's easy, it's not worth it anyway. So you gotta fight for your life. You gotta fight for it. Well, on behalf of the hundreds of young men and women that contact me with emails, texts, and phone calls, thank you for doing uh, doing these visits and engaging them. They appreciate that. Great. Well, I As Coach Landry, which some of you may not know, you know, Coach Landry was a, uh, in the Air Force. You don't know Coach Landry was in the Air Force. I used to say he flew jets, but I think he didn't have jets right then. He probably had a pop plane. He didn't have jets. He was flying by. And, and you know, Coach Dude was a Marine. Coach Dude was a Marine, but I, I had great leaders that worked with me, that was with me. And Coach Landry used to say something. He said, when you take something out of society, put something back in. Yeah, I was first of all to take a lot of society. Just think about it. I'm from right here, Georgia. Have any of you been to right here, Georgia? <laughs> if you got one year to live, you move to right here, don't you? It's like forever. <laughs> same old, same old, it's like Groundhog Day. Same old thing happened over and over. You're like, man, I got to get out of here. But I said, what's strange about it is I've come to where I'm at today, I've traveled all over the world, I've seen some things, amazing things. And so, so much has been given to me. And it is time for me to get back. And if I don't get back, I got to answer to God. And that's what I told my mom when I decided to run. I said, Mom, I answer someone far greater than man right now. And I can't help but I got to do what the Lord has called me to do because he's prepared me for a moment just like right here. That's what I'm here. <laughs> Specificity, any plans, any uh, conceptions of the things that you would like to do specifically to assist the veterans in this pursuit of uh, real stability? Well, you know, that's one thing I've been doing is I've been going around the state and listening to a lot of things because, you know, Georgia is also a huge agriculture thing. So, you know, I, know I want to be on the agriculture committee. I want to be on the Veterans Affairs Committee because I want to try to help veterans. I want to, because as I, I was had a meeting today, and I heard something that was very disturbing, and I'm saying because I'm just shocked at this, that because we have veterans that didn't take the vaccine, they lose all their, everything that they work for them. It is taken away from them. Are we serious? Are we really serious that we would do that to our heroes that fought for this country? We got to take that benefit because they won't do what you say. That's what we're leading into if you don't get this vote right come November. The government will run your life. Because, and I hate to say that the Democrats want to control you, the Republicans seem to want to serve you. And I tell people this all the time. I would rather live on my feet fighting for my rights than to die on my knees and beg for something. Because that's what I'm asking you. Senator from Georgia, you'll have the opportunity, you'll be in a position to wield some considerable influence. How would you pair yourself? How would you differentiate yourself from your opponent, Mark Murphy on the one hand, and the veterans Well, first of all, I, I would get down to bases and go to bases and see and listen to the people. It seems that he's not in the campaign. I've never seen him on the campaign trail. All I see is about debates. I don't know why he's not out campaigning, but I'll get out and talk to the people, see what's going on with the veterans, see what's, what's going what's going through, through what's happening with these. Rather than sit up and watch them with the elite, make decisions, but they never get down and get their hands dirty. You gotta get your you roll your sleeves up and get your hands dirty. I don't mind getting dirty. 
And that's what I would say I would do. That's what's going to make me different because I don't answer to no one. I don't answer to no one in the guy. Virtual walking, I said, girl, I never, I don't dance and sing for nobody. I do it my way because I do it the way God wants me to do it. I don't dance and sing for nobody, and I never will. That's not the way I do things, and I serve the people, not no political group, not no press thing. I serve the people because when people get elected to office, they're supposed to serve the people that elected them to office and not serve themselves or serve some party. Why do our military serve the men and women take a oath that I would defend this country, foreign and domestic, with my life, and they're held accountable? But when you go to office and elected office, this is not you to defend the Constitution. And yet they're now the one to defend that. So who's going to hold them accountable? Well, they are so We got time for one more question. So I'm going to open it up to the audience. And Eddie, you got a question? Hey, Herschel, Stan and Donna Fitzgerald with Veterans for America First. We endorsed you. My question is uh, we're also supporting first responders. We know you love the veterans, but could you just tell us a little bit about your feelings for our first responders? You know, that's so sad. Our first responders during the pandemic, our first responders was, they were there for us. But yet our government again comes in and wants to put mandates on them. And it is amazing why we want to continue to put mandates and set through control. Our first responders every day, they're called. And right now the morale is down. The morale is down. Recruitment is down. And it's only down because of why. Because you put the wrong people at the table negotiating for them. And that's why I said, God, you gotta get this right from no memory. Tell your friends, you gotta get it right. And if there's some other country, and maybe somebody in the audience knows this, maybe I don't. If anyone in the audience knows a country better than the United States of America, please stand up and tell me where it's at. Stand up and tell me where that country is at because maybe I wanna go. Because I can promise you that's not much better than here. Because to have the decision you have here, you can't do it in no other place. You can't do it in any other place. Yes, sir. Herschel, if God willing, you get elected. Oh, no, I'm going to get elected. Would you push to have all citizens? Oh, that's what I, I believe in the immigration. And I'm not sure why all the equipment is laying down on the ground. They just came to wall. We got to help believe in immigration. That's one of the things I've been seeing in my business session. As I've been meeting with the law enforcement, one of the major problems they said they have is immigration. And I'm going to tell you guys something you may not know. And I didn't know this because Georgia is not a border state. But I learned that 70% of the drugs coming over the border go through Atlanta, Georgia. And you go, wow. So we have to have and I, 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 anything that we can do to lead immigration, and, and, and we have to do that. Can I just ask one question? Yes, if you are, when you are, yeah, that's what you do. When you are elected, when you go to Washington, let's get rid of the Department of Education, bring the education back to the state, get CRT out of the school system, get rid of the LGBT. Checking me. I'm always getting checked. They check me all the time. That, that reminds me, several years ago, there, there was a study done in the Department of Agriculture. There were seven bureaucrats in the Department of Agriculture for every one farmer in America. Y'all got things backwards. One thing I think for the uh, 
think I'm speaking for most of the veterans. I'm not sure there's another group, another demographic within our country that can appreciate what we had here. We had the opportunity as veterans to, uh, sometimes not really an opportunity, we go to third world countries, we see people in the uh, most difficult of circumstances, and we have to look, we look at it, and it, for me, and I know that speaks to many of you here, when we're in those very difficult circumstances, and we see our flag, our American flag, flag flying over our count, compound, you can't help but be homesick. You can't help but appreciate the blessings that God has given us by being in this free nation. So I'm not sure that there's another demographic that can appreciate the fidelity that a veteran can, the, the blessings God's given us by being in this country. That's true. I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to just leave you with this here. Always leave when you think about something. But I heard a story one time. About this guy that died, he went to heaven early. He died, he went to heaven early, and when he got there, St. Peter met him at the early gate, and St. Peter said, Hold on, wait a minute. He said, You're here a little early right now, so for the first time, you get to make a choice where you want to go. He said, You can go to heaven ahead, but you get to make a choice. I can take you to both places. See, so he, he, he got to get some, put him in his elevator, and takes him all the way down to heaven. They get the hell in the door open, and now the party going on. People are having a great time. People drinking, they have friends there, and he doesn't have no marvelous time. People dress nice, look good. And St. Peter came to him and said, We got to leave now. We got to leave. He said, Wait, I got to go right now. He said, Yes, you got to make a choice. He said, Yes, and he get in the elevator and go all the way up to heaven. And they get the heaven in the doors open. There's people floating around the cloud. The weather is nice, and people are laughing and having a good time. St. Peter came to him and said, you got to make a decision now. He said, uh, I do. He said, yeah. He said, well, St. Pete, I hate to tell you, I want to go to hell. He said, that seemed like my type of place down there. He said, you sure? He said, yeah, I want to go to hell. The guy gets in the elevator, go all the way go back down to hell, and the door's open. There's no party. It's hot. People clothes are ripped and screaming and just having a miserable time. He said, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. A couple of hours ago, there was a party going on. And Satan shows up and said, a couple of hours ago, I was campaigning. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you that. <laughs> Don't listen or see the lie. You see it right before your eyes. Yeah. They're not hiding it from you, but they keep telling you something different. Thank you.